Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Dr. Richard L. Hoffman's memorial service. I'm Joe Kuiper. I'm the museum's executive director, and I'd like to bid welcome to uh, Richard's family, to his colleagues, to his admirers, to his co-workers. But I think it would be best said today, and I think Richard would like this, if I just say, welcome friends. So for today, we have some memories of Richard Hoffman, and we're going to have a number of his former um, colleagues and some of the folks that he influenced greatly as a scientist and they're going to give some words and we're going to then open up the microphone that if you have some memories about Richard that you'd like to share with everyone please come up to the microphone and we will uh, proceed with that. And first up is Dr. Noel Boaz who is a senior fellow here at the museum and also the founding executive director of the Virginia Museum of Natural History. Noel? Good afternoon. Richard Hoffman was uh, a friend of mine and also one of the very first members of this museum. He was the first curator hired in the new Virginia Natural, uh, Museum of Natural History back in 1989. And he finished a career of 29 years at Radford University as a professor of zoology before that. So it's remarkable to think back on Richard's career actually double career because he, he finished as a professor for uh, what would for most people be a quite productive and remarkable tenure, but then actually started in on a new career with, with us. I felt back in those days that Richard was still a young man and that his future lay before him. And I think in a, in a real sense it did because he was one of the true founders and founding scientists of this museum. He's a quintessential museum scientist. Uh, even though he came from a very different field from mine, uh, I deal with creatures that have backbones and particularly that are related to us humans. Uh, Richard was an expert on that large array of biological forms that don't have backbones. So he was a very important early influence for us and a connecting point to the natural scientists here in Virginia uh, that were in that area of biology. So he was a very inform important informative uh, influence. He was passionate about collections and he was passionate about field work. He was very much dedicated to maintaining this feeling of biological diversity and the understanding of biological diversity and he shared that with uh, many other uh, world-class biologists and brought that to this museum. I think that the th one of the things that really impressed me both, most about Richard was his reverence for specimens. And I'm going to tell two brief stories about uh, from his undergraduate career because he didn't come to this reverence for the museum any time recently. He had been like that forever. And he told me this story once when I was working on the pulling together the collections in the state and particularly this large collection that was up in Charlottesville at the, at the former Brooks Museum of Natural History at the University of Virginia. Um, and Richard said that he remembered and he remembered with sort of a quavering voice the destruction of the mammoth at University of Virginia. He was walking to class one day in 1949, and as he approached the north part of the grounds at the University of Virginia, where if of those of you have, who have been there might remember, there's a sort of, a, of an outlier building. It doesn't face the rotunda, it faces Monticello, and it's got a very different type of architecture. There's a whole history behind that. But Richard was right in front of that museum, and they were in the process of moving out all of the old natural history collections. And one of those natural history collections, one of the exhibits, was a reconstructed mammoth, full size, made of um, plaster. He had glass eyes, plaster tusks, and Argentinian pompous grass all over him. Richard watched with horror as the men of the buildings and grounds crew smashed up the ma mammoth with sledgehammers. 
And Richard told me that he saw one of his eyes pop out and the student ran off with it. And, but it, it's indicative of the way that he told that story, how personally he felt about that. The other story that I want to just uh, sort of say the, you know, communicate the same thing is uh, one time when we were in the old museum, which uh, I still have fond memories of, which is down the road here on 1001 Douglas Avenue, uh, Richard came to my office one day and he's cradling something in his, his hands. And he says, I have something for you. And I looked at it and I couldn't quite make out what it was. And he said, here, you, you may have this. I, I rescued this in 1949 from the trash barrels behind the biology department uh, at the University of Virginia. And it was a bird, but it was really the most moth-eaten, terribly preserved bird that I had seen. And um, I said, well, thank you, Richard. I thought it's just really, really great. So why, why, why this bird? And he says, well, this is, this is a bird out of the old Brooks uh, collections. And I thought, since you're so involved in that, that you would like to have it. And uh, so I kept it, and I, and I hope it's still in the collections here. But it's, it, that was a good 30 years after he had picked it up. So it just bespeaks of Richard's commitment to collections and to museums. His career with the VMNH actually started before he became a curator here. In 1984, we first incorporated this institution as a nonprofit organization. In 1985, we started a group called the Scientific Advisory Board. This is a full four years before we actually became the State Museum. Uh, but it was called the Virginia Museum of Natural History. And Richard became one of the first and founding members of this Scientific Advisory Board. And I think that very little attention has been paid really historically to the importance of this board in the formation of the museum. Uh, but uh, Professor Michael Kostrob is who, here was also a member of that. Richard was very important in, in getting that started. And we, um, uh, he served as chair of that board for a while. And that really was the, the studies that were done by that group that Richard had a very strong hand in, helped us to develop this, um, the whole plan for this place. It would be, I would be remiss if I didn't say that Richard was a strong advocate for his field. Uh, in my role, I had to uh, balance a number of different disciplines. We started out the plan with 15 curators. Uh, we would like to have had curators in ornithology, in botany, and in astronomy. 15 curators um, are very, very expensive. So by the time that we had winnowed this down through process with the General Assembly and the Budgetary Committee, we had it down to 12 curators when we entered the process of negotiations with the budget. Finally, we ended up with eight curators. At every juncture, Richard was there making sure that recent invertebrates and invertebrate biology made the cut. So he was always there for his field and it was, it was always important for him to make sure that his field, and he always reminded us that the, the invertebrates are much more numerous than the things that most of, of the rest of us study. Um, I think that, I'll just end by saying that um, the slideshow was very apropos, I think, in saying that uh, Richard had um, a well-spent life. He died with his boots on, and many of us who do the same sort of science think that's a, a great way to go. Um, he was at work. He had an extraordinary long and productive career, and he enjoyed the friendship and admiration of many around the world. Many remember Richard as occupying a place in this museum up on the second floor, and they can't really remember, really conceive of this museum without him. But for me, um, if his ghost were, be were to be found walking around the halls anywhere, I think that uh, in my memory it would be mostly at the old uh, building down at uh, 1001 Douglas Avenue. And I think that Richard confided in me more than once that he was really comfortable in that old building. And uh, this, this beautiful new glass and chrome structure, he couldn't quite figure out how to, to work the locks on the doors. And I think his little dog, Carla, liked the place down there uh, a little bit better. Uh, we'll miss Richard, but we must not forget him. Uh, he has established a very bar high bar for the future curators to meet. And uh, we thank him for that. And we wish him well.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boas. Uh, next up, we have one of our research associates who's had a long association with the Virginia Museum of Natural History, Dr. Joseph C. Mitchell. Dr. Mitchell? I first met Richard in the late 1970s at a Virginia Herpetological Society meeting. Um, we all know that he's a renowned invertebrate biologist, millipede specialist, and so on, but he never lost his love of amphibians and reptiles. In fact, those animals is what inspired him to get him to uh, develop an interest in natural history in, in, his, in his youth in the Clifton Forge. And some of his first papers were, in fact, on reptiles and amphibians. Um, his interest in writing, which he became extremely good at, uh, was stimulated, he told me, by receiving reprints from herpetologists at the time. And he thought this was the bee's knees. He thought this was the best thing going and he would love to do that himself. So he wrote his own first professional scientific papers at age 16. And uh, he had a d special way of writing. I guess one would call it a Victorian somewhat style. And I asked him, how did he develop that style of writing? He said, I taught myself. I made myself learn how to write like that. So it didn't come natural, he had, to, he had to learn that. Above all else, Richard wanted to describe new species. He wanted to describe new amphibians and reptiles, in fact, did a couple, but um, he was told at the time, this is the mid 40s, get you, that the field of herpetology was already too crowded. And he was told that by a very egotistical herpetologist, but Richard took that to heart, felt very discouraged, and then when he was at UVA, discovered a group of animals that he really wanted to work with. But it turns out that, as we know, it, he be, became the quintessential uh, expert in millipedes. But he told me one time that he was so afraid of animals with hairs and legs that a friend of his could have chased him through a rhododendron thicket with a millipede. And he, of course, changed that, uh, that perspective, but until his death, he would not even work on flies or caterpillars because of those hairs. Okay. Richard seemed to me to live a fairly simple life. He didn't have many possessions. I didn't, it didn't seem to me that he had, certainly didn't have a cluttered apartment or house. Um, but he was happy most of his life, as long as there was chocolate cake to eat for lunch. Uh, he didn't need an elaborate lab or fancy equipment to do his work. He needed a basic microscope. But what he did have that allowed him to make so many, so many and so Im many important contributions to science was a very discerning eye for detail, a vast knowledge of the scientific literature, and a memory that most of us will never match, certainly not me. How else could he have published so many papers on so many different taxonomic groups without knowing all of that literature. And in fact, he was even working on plants. Um, he was just finishing up a project on the distribution of sweet gum in Virginia. Um, we all know that he loved Virginia. Uh, that was his background. And uh, he loved the Southern Appalachian Mountains as well. He had seen more of the state by the time, by his early 20s, than most Virginians will ever see in their lifetime. And I dare say he had driven more than a million miles in the state, in various places. And a lot of that was done before he was even in, uh, in his early 20s. Um, he knew geology, he knew natural history, he knew climate, he knew Virginia history. Um, and, but he witnessed the loss of a lot of the rural countryside and natural habitat due to the change from rural countryside to urban centers and so on. And he was very upset with that. He, he ultimately became something of a conservation biologist, uh, became a, a very strong supporter of the Dage Conservancy and took every opportunity to write about and convince people to take better care of the natural history of the state. Um, I don't know anyone who could identify 
most of the animals and most of the plants here in Virginia. Uh, for a long time, I would view, I viewed him, in fact, I think I told him one time that I called him the grand old man of Virginia natural history. Um, and I still think that's true. Um, he was a bottomless pit with respect to knowledge about the state and was always a, a, uh, an important resource. Back in the early 90s, um, I wanted to start a new journal. And I asked Richard about it, and we conferred. And, and uh, ultimately, in, in 90, 1992, we published the first issue of uh, This was a, a journal devoted to Virginia's natural history of all the different disciplines and so on. It was named after John Bannister, who was the first university-trained English naturalist to work here in the state in the, in the 1600s and died and was killed, actually, in uh, 1692. So in 1992, we inaugurated the new journal on behalf of John Bannister. Um, Richard supported this journal monetarily, but he also supported it with many, many papers. As of this new issue coming out, number 39, he will have published 77 contributions for this particular, this, this, this particular journal, in addition to all the other things that he did. Um, we'll never really know the true depth of Richard's knowledge. I told him one time that I would love to plug a USB port into the back of his head and hit download. <laughs> so, he said one time he, that in order to learn something new, something else would have to go. He felt his brain was so full that he, so what can we say about Richard? Um, in addition to being a, a very good, loving family man, he was a born teacher, a world-class scientist, a natural historian, a writer, an artist, a friend, a colleague, a mentor to some of us, and a true inspiration. Uh, he was truly a quiet leader, actually, in science and natural history, led by example. He showed us that one can achieve great things by being humble, unassuming and patient, and by simply being a Southern gentleman, as he was. I have deep roots in Virginia. I go back a long way, not only my age, but also my roots. Um, lived here most of my life. I now live in Florida. And I have something of a distant perspective of the state of Virginia. And when I see Virginia now, I see a huge void, a void with his loss that will never be filled. For, in my mind, Virginia will forever be changed with his passing. Last time I saw Richard was about a year ago, this month. Spent a couple days with him here um, and, 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 and enjoyed, always enjoyed working with Richard, always enjoy hearing him talk about things that he was excited about. And the first thing he told me when I walked in the door, he said, look at this bug. This, he was so excited about this bug. He found it while he was taking a break in the swimming pool because it had, flo it had gotten stuck on the, on, the, on the surface of the water. And it turned out to be the second record for the state of Virginia, this particular species. He was so excited because he thought one would never find it again in the state. So we've all lost an, an irreplaceable resource and a great friend. And frankly, I still can't believe he's gone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Next up, we have uh, one of our senior fellows and a uh, fellow uh, uh, millipede expert, Dr. William Shear. So, Dr. Shear. In his play, Antony and Cleopatra, Shakespeare has a soothsayer say this. In the book of nature, a little can I read. But I think when we remember Richard, we would have to say that he could read more than a little in the book of nature. And in fact, through his long career and his many publications, he actually wrote quite a few chapters of the book of nature. Uh, Joe has spoken very eloquently about Richard's uh, accomplishments with regard to Virginia and Virginian natural history, but I would like all of you to know 
what a worldwide reputation Richard had. Uh, we have a, uh, an internet discussion group or an internet list on myriapods. And when Richard passed on, I used that to let his colleagues all over the world know what had happened. And I was flooded with emails from everywhere, from Russia, from most of the countries of Europe, uh, from many places in the United States, South America, and even Southeast Asia, where Richard was recognized as being one of the leading authorities on this group of organisms, once very obscure, but now beginning to assume its proper place as uh, a group of organisms that can be very useful in understanding big problems like ecology, evolution, and biogeography. And so uh, Richard's loss was really felt not just here in Virginia, but, uh, but around the world. And it was, uh, for me, a great personal loss. I first came in contact with Richard, not personally, but indirectly, in 1959. I was an undergraduate student at the time, and I had already decided that I was going to uh, study arthropod systematics. And I had been doing a lot of collecting in Ohio, where I went to school. I collected a lot of millipedes, but the resources for identifying millipedes at that time were virtually non-existent. So the idea was, well, someone told me there's this guy down in Virginia at Radford University who knows a lot about millipedes. So being a kind of a uh, undergraduate still with the bark on, I thought, well, I'll just write this guy and see if he'll look at specimens. And oftentimes you might think, well, somebody's going to see a letter like this from some college kid up in Ohio and say, ah, uh, forget about that. Why is he bothering me? But that wasn't at all the case. Practically by return mail, I got back a long letter directing me to all kinds of resources that I could use and in fact even offering to look at specimens and of course what I collect is the most common stuff but I didn't know what it was. And so that began a correspondence that continued through my first stint in graduate school and uh, really carried on now for uh, almost 50 years. Uh, I first met Richard personally, however, in 1967 uh, at my first college teaching job, which was at Concord College, uh, a school in Athens, West Virginia. It's not very far from here. It now styles itself as uh, Concord University, but I don't see that necessarily very much about it has changed. So we had corresponded, and of course, as, I'm, as I already mentioned, that meant writing actual letters on paper. Remember that? I think some of you probably do. Richard, of course, parenthetically, once uh, email became available, uh, embraced it slowly but eventually wholeheartedly because it really meant that he could, with his many colleagues all over the world, literally carry on conversations so that what would have taken weeks to exchange could be done in an afternoon. But anyway, uh, I was still in trouble with millipedes, still trying to figure them out. And the fauna of West Virginia is much more complex than that of uh, Ohio. So again, I appealed to Richard. And finally, in 1967, I at last met him face to face. And I don't know what I was expecting. I guess I was expecting some uh, very prepossessing guy about six foot four and, uh, you know, a real giant of the field. But uh, Richard was so immediately approachable and so friendly and so unassuming uh, that you just felt immediately that you had known him uh, for years. And so that started a relationship in which we exchanged visits back and forth. I think that first time we met in 1967, we probably talked for about seven hours straight. And 
Each visit back and forth between Athens and Radford uh, was similar. And at that time, I, only, I had a master's degree, and I recognized that if I was going to go on, I was going to have to get a PhD. And uh, Richard was very encouraging. He said, you've got to do it. Uh, you know, this is not going to last forever. Right now, it's easy to get jobs with master's degrees, but you've got to get your PhD. So uh, he said, to get your PhD, especially with your grades, which were terrible, I've never been a good student. I think I'm a good teacher, but I've never been a very good student. Anyway, Richard said, you've got to get some research work out there. You've got to publish some papers so that people will know that you have some capability. So uh, he said, I've got this uh, specimen that someone sent me. It looks like it's a new genus of millipedes. So you can make a splash by describing this new genus. Well, that turned out to be the only bum steer that Richard ever gave me <laughs> because the so-called new genus was actually just an aberrant specimen of a very well-known species. But I published it as a new genus and uh, eventually realized the error and have been trying to collect all possible copies of that paper <laughs> ever since. So if anyone in this audience has one, I'll give you 10 bucks. <laughs> but otherwise, uh, Richard was uh, a source of excellent advice, a real fount of wisdom. In fact, he started me working on a genus called Pseudotremia, which he had an enormous collection of. And uh, when I finally did get into graduate school, it was expected that I was going to work on spiders, but the spider group that they wanted me to work on was extremely boring, whereas the genus Pseudotremia was fantastic and fascinating. There were all these species all over the Appalachians. Some of them lived in caves. Some of them were on top of high mountains and so on. So I went to my advisor my formal advisor and said, I'd really, 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 really much rather work on millipedes for my thesis. And he said, well, I don't know anything about millipedes. <laughs> I said, yeah, but you don't have to because Richard Hoffman will help me out and advise me. He said, well, in that case, fine, work on millipedes. So I worked on millipedes and eventually uh, produced an enormous uh, dissertation on them. And Richard was the person that I turned to for advice pretty much every step of the way. We had a, a little uh, adventure while I was in graduate school at Harvard. It was uh, about a species called Nanaria infesta. And Richard wondered if this species might not actually be an earlier name for a species in a genus that he had just finished revising and published on. But the type specimen was nowhere to be found. OK, so this is getting technical. But, but if you can't find the type specimen, formally speaking, it's very difficult to identify what a name refers to. The type specimen was supposed to be at the Museum of Comparative Zoology where I was working, but it was not in the collections anywhere. And then Richard realized that the name Infesta referred to a small fact that was mentioned in the paper in which the species was originally described that it had a fungus growing on it, a parasitic fungus. So Richard said, you know what? I'll bet that that type specimen, instead of being in the zoological collections, is in the fungal herbarium. And it happened to be just across the quad. So I went over there, which was an adventure in itself, if you've never been in a fungus herbarium that was created from an old chapel. Uh, it was amazing. I won't go into it. We don't have time for that. But in any case, the specimen was there. It was classified as, a as something that had a new fungus on it. We got the specimen. It did displace the older name. And uh, that was the first joint publication that Richard and I uh, brought out. So after I finished my degree, I bounced around for a while. And eventually, I wound up where I am now at uh, Hampton Sydney College. And it was great to be there because it meant that I was within easy driving distance of Richard, and we could again trade visits back and forth, and we have done for close to 40 years now. Uh, Richard frequently traveled to Richmond. I don't think he ever uh, made that trip without making a stop, at least at my office or at my house, so we could spend some time talking about millipedes. And because of my association with the museum, 
uh, I came down to Martinsville quite frequently. Richard knew so much about what I guess we can now call the old biology, uh, natural history and the study of whole organisms that uh, I know that I could never equal the breadth of his knowledge and I doubt if there is anyone that I've ever encountered in the area of biology that had such a breadth of knowledge. He reminded me very much of Edward O. Wilson and if you read Wilson's autobiography, Naturalist, uh, much of what is in it could also describe Richard's life, uh, particularly the young man who early on developed a fascination with reptiles and insects. And so our personal and professional relationships tended to be close. I always regarded Richard as not just a mentor, but also as a close personal friend. And many of our conversations weren't entirely about millipedes, but about um, you know, personal things that the two of us were uh, dealing with in various ways at the time. And Noel has spoken about how Richard died with his boots on, and I think that that's a very astute observation because when his final illness struck him, he was doing what he had done almost his whole life and was still doing. It reminded me when I was at Concord, there was a uh, plaque in the library about uh, a librarian back in the early 1900s who had died at his post. And I thought, well, what was he doing? Did people come in to steal books? And he was defending the books and so on. But in the case of Richard, when he was stricken at his post, he was, I think, defending something that is a very important tradition and one that unfortunately is rapidly dying out, and that is the integral tradition of natural history. And that is something that I hope that many of us in this room can continue to perpetuate and keep going for at least a few more years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shear. Uh, next up, we have another research associate, um, a common face around here, actually, Dr. Stephen Robley. Stephen? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we're here to remember a very special person, a man who became a very close friend of mine during the past 20 years. Like everyone else here, I was very sad when I learned of Richard's passing last month. I expected him to survive the heart surgery and live for at least another decade and continue to be scientific productive for most of those 10 or more years. Uh, as has been already said, Richard was widely respected and admired by his colleague, students, and friends worldwide. Uh, upon his death, I sent out a notice to about 150 people worldwide and received feedback, as did Bill, from many of them. And I'd like to mention just a couple of their comments. I'm sure they echo uh, some of your own thoughts as well as my own, just real quickly here. Uh, Statements such as a great person, one of a kind, an incredible scientist, extraordinarily productive, a kind person, a true gentleman, a friend to all of us, a great all-around naturalist, a wonderful teacher and mentor, a good friend and outstanding scientist, a wise man, helpful, humble, humorous, generous, an inspiration to many, a mentor to so many people, uh, one of the most amazing people I have ever met, a great loss to science. He always made time for us amateurs. He leaves large shoes to fill, and he will be missed. And certainly that is uh, one of the major ones in my life as well. Uh, Richard generally shared his vast knowledge with professional colleagues, amateur naturalists, educators, students, and children. Uh, in conjunction with a 2007 birthday party here for his 80th birthday, I did receive a, a number of letters that I put into a, a, like a scrapbook and such for Richard. And one of those was from a former student at Radford who later became a teacher. And uh, I just want to quote some of the comments here. Uh, to the question, which professor was most helpful in under, your understanding of biology? 
uh, the response was, Dr. Hoffman was the most helpful. He made us think. He encouraged us to dig for answers. He never criticized the student. If an answer was incorrect, he encouraged us to look for another solution. He gave us tools to use when we entered the teaching profession and when we began to work with our own students. For that, I am very grateful. Uh, I first met Richard in uh, November of 1991 when I was actually employed by the state of Massachusetts. There was a regional meeting of biologists up, at, up uh, in Luray, and he was the dinner, after dinner speaker one night and gave an excellent stimulating talk in Virginia biogeography. And, uh, after the talk, everybody just crowded up to Richard because they all wanted to know more about what, what, he, what he knew about Virginia and, and natural history. Uh, by chance, about seven months uh, later, I, I actually got a job with the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation in Richmond and, and moved here uh, to Virginia. Uh, and I've been here for 20 years. Uh, we soon became close colleagues and friends and had many uh, mutual interests in a diversity of different animal groups. Uh, we tried to go out in the field one or more times a year. I tried to visit the museum several times a year, and we had all kinds of emails and phone calls back and forth. Uh, looking back on my archived emails, I have over a thousand messages. Each one has some kind of useful information or a little quote or a, words of wisdom. Uh, so even though I've deleted a lot, I, I still have a thousand of those messages that, I, that I'm going to try to go through over the next year or two. Uh, just a funny thing as far as some of the field trips, uh, I can think of two in particular. Uh, running a, a sheet with a, a ultraviolet light to collect moths. Uh, both one time at Buffalo Mountain, which is, which is uh, in Floyd County, about an hour and a half from here, and another time on White Top Mountain, which is the highest, second highest mountain in Virginia. That's probably a good two hours away. Richard drove all the way out to both those places. I think one night it was kind of cold, there were hardly any bugs, and he said, oh, I gotta go back home. And he just turned around and off he went, and they said, you don't wanna stay in my motel? No, I gotta go home. And he didn't like sleeping in motel rooms the last decade or so of his life. He said, and, and he didn't like to pay for them, whatever. But I said, you got a free room? No, I gotta go home. I got work to do back at the museum tomorrow kind of thing, you know? And then the other time at White Top, I think it was kind of foggy, and again, we weren't catching many. He said, I gotta go. So off he went after just, you know, hanging around for maybe an hour, and he was back on his way home. Um, now, Joe, Joe mentioned the journal Band Hysteria. Uh, he, he started that with Joe as co-editor and then decided in late uh, 1999 to give that up. And uh, I was honored that he asked me to succeed him as the uh, co-editor that year. And then uh, I am now the uh, sole editor. Uh, he constantly encouraged me to, to publish, to do good editing, to collect specimens. Uh, he thought I had a good knack for finding unusual things. And uh, he said, if anybody's going to find it, it's going to be you. Uh, I was always grateful to receive Richard's seal approval for every issue of the journal Band Hysteria, as well as a, a previous one that I did uh, called Kate's Vienna. Uh, I sought his advice and expertise many times on issues related to species, habitats, editorial matters, um, and I was honored to help organize uh, the 80th birthday celebration we had here at the museum in September 2007, and then also help co-edit the Proceedings Volume, The Fresh Trip, which is up on the front here. Uh, that was published almost exactly two years later, pretty close to his, his 82nd birthday. I think it might have came in the museum a, a week early, and he said, well, nobody really knows. Let's call it my birthday as far as the publication date for that. And I was very personally gratified that that, that, that book did receive Richard's very strong approval, because it was sometimes hard to get him to say a book was good or not, but he, he really liked that. So, and uh, the first chapter in the book is a biography that I wrote. It's about, I don't know, 40 pages or something like that. And, he, when I was done and he read it, he said, you know more about me and my life and my family than I know about, about all these people. So I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, Richard kind of came from humble beginnings. Uh, I think he was born in the proper century as far as being a kind of old-fashioned naturalist, if you will. He was born in a small town in Clifton Forge, which is near the West Virginia border in Allegheny County, Virginia, in the mountains in 1927. His father worked as a machinist for the railroad company. His mother was a homemaker. Uh, his father did keep a job throughout the Depression, so he said their family didn't really feel any uh, hardships through the Depression. He did have an older brother, but he was seven years older than Richard, so by the time Richard was a teenager, his brother was already off to college, uh, so they didn't spend quite as much time together as if they were closer in age. As a youth in the late 1930s and early 40s, Richard was allowed to roam the forest and, and mountains surrounding the town of Clifton Forge. Uh, back then, he didn't have concerns about child molesters, trespassing, things like that. So I think in that era, you know, that was the right time to be born. And as Joe mentioned, he initially was very interested in amphibians and reptiles, especially salamanders, but then he got into the invertebrates. Uh, I think a key point in his life is that his parents did, in fact, support and encourage his natural history in interests, helped him buy the few books that are available on that subject, nothing like what's out there today. Uh, 
He graduated in 1944 at the age of 16, which was the typical age you graduate actually back then. But that summer and fall, he started writing a weekly newspaper column of nature columns for the local newspaper. Uh, and back then, you have to remember, there wasn't the internet, there were very few books in the libraries, there weren't field guides, so you know, he had to work pretty hard to get his material or just based it on personal observations that he gathered from his walks around. Uh, through these nature columns, Richard showed his already considerable knowledge, diverse interests, excellent writing skills, and concern for conservation. But then at the end of that year, after writing 27 weekly columns, he just abruptly stopped writing them. Uh, and I said, well, why'd you do that? He says, well, I was kind of bored. I wanted to move on to something else. And then maybe, that, maybe that's why he had so many projects. He'd sort of, he'd work on 50 projects at once rather than one or two at a time, finish him and go on the next one. He'd, he'd always have dozens of projects simultaneously. And so what he did after that is he started writing scientific papers instead of, of the nature columns. Uh, through hard work, perseverance, and great passion, within a few decades, he reached the pinnacle of two fields, as we already heard. He was a world expert on millipede classification and the leading expert on Virginia's uh, invertebrate fauna or natural history in general, uh, still an expert in, in herps and in the field called biogeography. So he was truly a giant in two different fields at the same time. And I agree with everyone else that there will be never, never be anyone like him in terms of the vast knowledge. Uh, you know, we have a program now where, where students can enroll in something called the Master Naturalist Program. It's kind of like Master Gardeners. Uh, you know, Richard, in my mind, is truly the Master Naturalist but, um, in terms of that sense. Uh, as Joe mentioned, or somebody mentioned, his goal was to describe new species. He described more than 600 species, subspecies, and genera, mostly millipedes, but also spiders, worms, centipedes, amphibians, and reptiles. He was also very proud that about 50 species were named in his honor. Uh, which is quite a few. Most people have one or two, if any, but he, he, had, he had about 50. Uh, and at times he would say, well, that's pretty close to the number for uh, Ernst Meyer or maybe Charles Darwin. I don't know the full the actual numbers, but he knew he was up there maybe in the top 10 or 20. So he was pretty proud of that, to be honest with you. Uh, but despite describing so many species, I don't think he really had a goal to describe X number of species in his life. Like, I want to do 500 before I die. I don't, he, he didn't have that goal. Or I want to publish 500 papers. That wasn't his goal either. Uh, because, for example, if you think about the millipedes of Virginia, we have about 200 species of millipedes in Virginia. Only 100 of them have scientific names. So he didn't feel that I have to go out and put names on these other 100. He always uh, typically did his descriptions based on, he wanted to describe in the context of all their relatives, so not just willy-nilly describe 100 species and say, here's 100 more names. Some of the people in the early part of the uh, 20th century did that, and he, he never uh, liked those papers at all. Um, so, regrettably, uh, now we still have 100 species of millipedes in Virginia that don't have scientific names. Uh, and again, I think he was born in the right century, the, or part of the century, because the old-fashioned natural history was still acceptable. Uh, he was a lifelong learner, and he really had an insatiable quest for knowledge. He was very devoted to learning and curating new groups of insects and invertebrates in the collection here at the expense of writing more and more scientific papers. So, uh, and he occasionally would express to me a slight guilt complex of, I'm doing this when I should be writing papers on millipedes of South America or Asia or something like that. Um, and so in the last few years, he was trying to learn click beetles from scratch. He curated moths, which is one of the groups that had scales, which he avoided for like 50 years. And then he said, okay, I can handle them. And so he, he spent a lot of time in the last couple of years putting in uh, thousands of moths in the collection. He also, also was doing things like putting uh, small wasps on points and putting in the collection. And he, and he said to me several times in the last 10 years, if I was 30 years younger, I would start on this group or this group or this group. You know, it wasn't just one group. So uh, always trying to learn. Uh, and as Bill mentioned, even the computer technology, he slowly embraced it, learned how to do email, then how to do email attachments. And in the last month or two, he was sending the so-called emoticons, little smiley faces and all kinds of stuff like that. So <laughs> I guess he embraced computers after a while. Uh, he was a very generous man in terms of his time, his expertise. Uh, he, even though he had a great breadth of knowledge, he also knew his limits. So if he didn't know an answer to something, he would say, I don't know. He wouldn't make something up or kind of fudge it. He would honestly admit that he didn't know everything there is to know. And he did, he did tell me one time he had a, a visitor, I think from Russia, a millipede person, and they said, for the world expert, you sure say, I don't know a lot. But, you know, he was, he was uh, honest. He was also financially generous, uh, especially, for example, the Nature Conservancy. He was an acorn-level donor. Uh, but he was also generous here to the museum. Uh, not only was time... Uh, but money, he, you know, he bought most of the supplies, he bought books, uh, he probably never submitted an expense report for travel, it probably covered all his gas and food and uh, lodging out of his own pocket. So he really poured his heart and soul into the museum both before and after his retirement. And a lot of times was here, he didn't have a whole lot of uh, assistance to like pin the bugs, to sort the bugs, to make the labels, most of that he was actually 
typically doing on his own. Uh, so the move from, from Douglas Avenue to here was a little bit frustrating for him because you know they had security, the building was locked at seven o'clock at night or whatever, and sometimes not open on Sundays. He's like, well, what do I do now? You know, at the old building, he could go there 24 seven and work as much as he wanted to, middle of the night, or whatever. Uh, he did learn to shift from kind of an, uh, being a night owl to an early morning person so he could get here the first person when they open the doors in the morning and still stay here till seven o'clock at night. Uh, he was very passionate, as we probably heard already, strong advocate for natural history museums in general and this museum in particular. Uh, and he also emphasized that there's still much to learn about Virginia. So a lot of biologists run to the tropics, South America, Africa, et cetera, Asia to collect new species. He said, there's so much we don't know about Virginia. Why not just stay here? So there's new species to be found uh, either to science or new, new state records, uh, endemic species that are only occur, for example, in Virginia. Uh, and you know, a lot of times I would, uh, my staff donated a lot of specimens here to the museum over the last 20 years. And he would just painstakingly go through you know, jar after hundreds and hundreds of bugs. And he'd talk about all oh, the drudgery of going through every last specimen. Oh, but right in the bottom, there's a really good one. You know, so that golden nugget, as he called it, was what made the day worthwhile, that he got, he got something good out of it. And he did like to talk about the law of serendipity, where sometimes you find good stuff just by chance. You're not really trying to go out and find a particular thing. And, and boy, that, that, was, that was always good for him. And that's related to that uh, insect in the swimming pool, for example. Uh, and he does mention that in the paper. Uh, one quote from Richard, which maybe talks about, uh, expresses his passion. This is from a newspaper article, I believe, uh, where they listed his hobbies, actually, as crossword puzzles and collecting invertebrates. So those are his two hobbies in life. He wrote, Virginia is such a biographically diverse state with northern elements in the western region and southern elements in the east, as well as relic species and species found only within Virginia. Every trip is like an Easter egg hunt. I don't know what I'll find, but I do know what's going to be interesting. All I'm doing is pursuing my hobby. I should be paying for the privilege of doing this. This business of constant discovery is amazing. Uh, so he was kind of like a kid in a candy store all the time, just always finding good stuff. And probably at least half a dozen times in the last five years, he would send me this if I die tomorrow email where I found something good, but I might not live till Monday. So you better, I better write it down right now so you have it, Steve, and you can convey that to the scientific world. So many of those, not in the last month or so, but a while back. Um, most of his field work was confined to Virginia uh, and the southern Appalachians, especially the mountains in North Carolina, but, but probably 90%, I'm going to guess, would be in Virginia. Even though he was a world expert on millipedes of Africa and South America, as far as I know, he never traveled to either of those continents in his life, although he certainly had the means to do that. He just didn't feel that was a priority. Most of his uh, international travel was with a purpose, so he would go to uh, Europe and study the museums there, the collections, uh, went to one or two international congresses and millipede experts. And he went to Costa Rica 10 or 15 years ago as an advisor to a new natural history museum that was being started down there. Uh, be, being a native Virginian, he had a true bias towards Virginia. Even the collection here, he was almost to a fault, except for millipedes, didn't want a whole lot of specimens that weren't from Virginia. So if it was like from Maryland or North, maybe North Carolina, but like Maryland or West Virginia, I'm not really terribly interested in putting it here. Put it somewhere else. Give it to the Smithsonian or whatever. Um, He worked really hard to recruit, recruit new members to the society that Joe mentioned with a journal. Uh, as we all heard, he, he started working here at 62, which is basically when most people already retired. Uh, but this allowed him to really pursue his uh, passion. And he was a workaholic, as we all know. And he almost had his uh, goal fulfilled. This was quoted in one of the newspaper articles. The day I retire is when they find me dead at my microscope. Um, and I think, uh, secretly, he wanted to uh, work a few more years before retiring, but then he did not. Uh, I just want to say a couple things. As far as, uh, I think Richard probably had few regrets, but maybe some disappointments. He's probably uh, regret that he didn't finish all of his scientific papers. Um, he, he liked to talk about the word if, it's the biggest word in the dictionary that, you know, you really got to do stuff. Don't say you're going to do it, but actually go ahead and do it. Kind of the unplanted seed analogy. If you don't plant the seed, you don't get the plant. And uh, I think he's also maybe disappointed that fewer and fewer children nowadays are interested in natural history because of video games and things like that. Uh, I, I do find some solace in the last month of his life, Richard did a number of things. Uh, you know, he came to work up to the last day when he had the heart attack. He probably, I'm sure he dined at Snow's Diner, Jerry's Pizza, and some of his favorite places around town. He spent a weekend outing with his family up in Bath County near his home place. He uh, was an instructor one final time at the Wintergreen uh, Spring Wildflower event, uh, giving a talk and leading walks. He visited his older brother Hank in Grottos, Virginia. He attended his 70th high school class reunion in Clifton Forge, which was actually held two years early, so it was really the 68th. 
And uh, he also visited the Smithsonian Museum to see some of his friends. He hadn't been there in a couple of years. Uh, if Richard had a couple hypothetical, I mean, if Richard were still there, I think there's, uh, there's uh, some hypothetical thoughts. He would say, I had a good long life and lived my dream of being a naturalist and describing new species. You know, my avocation, uh, vocation was my avocation. I got paid for what I love to do. Uh, the parents, I think he would say, let your children pursue their own dreams and passions, as his own parents did. For kids, he would say, don't be afraid to set high goals and work hard to achieve them. To everyone, I think he would say, strive to be lifelong learners, continue to observe and study, read a lot, share your knowledge with others. And uh, we need to continue to educate the public about the wonders of natural history and the importance of museums and collections. And finally, uh, it's important that we conserve and protect natural habitats and rare species. Thank you. All right, we're going to have a couple remarks from the family. So from Richard's granddaughter, Mary Hoffman. So Mary, would you like to come up, please? Okay, um, I'm just going to recite a um, short poem that I wrote in honor of um, in honor of his um, in, nah, in honor of him. Ashes in the wind. Surgery for an endangered heart, troubles riddling the recovery, daily visits for checking in, a devastating discovery. No pain, no suffering, a quiet slipping away, as the church bells outside unknowingly play. The gentle hand of death, his soft caring eyes, as he leads your soul away through the skies. Alas, you may not be with us now, but rest assured our memories, will remain fond and full of your smiling face and clarity. Your ashes we will take and give to the wind atop of Mount Rogers and around his kin. Your last request, a final wish, a cherished memorial place, as we allow your ashes to swirl over our heads with elegant grace. Picked up by the wind, carried to far places, beautiful worlds, where pain can trouble you no longer, a place where freedom unfurls. We pray you find happiness and strength after this world and a life so long, and we assure that even after your death, our love for you stays strong. Thank you very much. And uh, lastly, in terms of the formal speakers, we'd like to hear from Richard's son, Carl W. Hoffman. So Carl? Thanks very much. Thank you. Wow. I, I hardly don't know what to say. Looking out here and seeing all of his friends and colleagues and family members, it's amazing, truly. Uh, before I get into my formal remarks, I'd like to thank each of the speakers that we've had uh, thus far for their wonderful memories and for volunteering to share them with us. It's been, it's been quite remarkable. I would also like to thank Dr. Kuyper and the whole staff here at the Virginia Museum of Natural History for the willingness and uh, desire to promote this event for my dad and also for the amount of time and energy that we know that they've put into it, particularly Carolyn and Melody and, and Cindy and Janet, um, to name a few. I'm certain that there are others. And I'm not a polished speaker, so I do have notes. Like everyone else here today, we simply weren't prepared for this, uh, the suddenness and the, uh, and the, uh, I guess the, um, the manner in which this happened. We, we all were probably misled in, into thinking that my dad was in much better health than he was. <clears throat> But uh, that probably just stemmed from the fact that he worked uh, you know, seven days a week and <laughs> 15 hours a day. We thought he was somewhat bulletproof. Um, and unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Yeah, we saw that he had slowed down a little in the last few years. But uh, to us, that was just a little bit of a slowdown, not much of a slowdown. So in fact, we recently had been talking about going back to Mount Rogers this fall and making one more attempt at gaining the summit. Two years ago, we'd gotten close. We'd gotten to within a half a mile of, of getting there, and he wanted to go back. So he told us that he had been working out down at the golf course and, and practicing and getting in shape. 
So we were looking forward to that. Imagine our surprise when we got the call from the doctor at the hospital. So back in April, about some five weeks before his heart attack, we had the good fortune to spend a long weekend with him. Uh, he had called earlier and said he wanted to go to the Bath County Pump Storage Facility, something he had, um, he'd been wanting to do since it was built in the mid-80s. So he came up Friday night, and uh, we got up early Saturday morning. That was me, my brother, my dad, and his three Blacksburg granddaughters, Mary, Rachel, and Ella. We packed a picnic lunch, and we headed off. We stopped at Goshen Pass along the way and picked through some leaf litter, which was customary. We didn't find anything, but it was fun. Um, but the whole weekend really was just reminiscent of growing up with my father. You know, weekends with my dad were basically trekking in the woods, in creeks and rivers, on some remote mountaintop, and, um, you know, basically just cruising the back roads of Virginia. I can't tell you how many miles I think somebody mentioned earlier that he'd probably been on every back road in Virginia. And we were there for a lot of that. So he always had the hope of finding some new interesting or rare species. He had a collection of uh, alcohol jars and vials with him. And um, throughout the whole time, we've got a great education in uh, natural history and science and biology and uh, you name it, geography, geology, any number of scientific uh, disciplines. And we developed a deep appreciation for all living things. I say living things, but I'm not talking about the bugs that we collected and dropped in the jars that eventually became part of his vast collection. So when we were teenagers and while he was still a, a professor at Radford University, he got a wild hair and branched out and decided to do something different, which was build a house. So uh, I can remember fondly the weekends that my brother and I spent over in Radford working on the house. <laughs> Um, learning carpentry and plumbing and brick laying and tile laying as you saw earlier uh, numerous other vocational skills so he was a teacher but it wasn't strictly about life sciences it was a, a well-rounded education that we got from him um, back in the 80s my sister moved away she moved to Florida and where she married and planted her roots um, and she gave my father his first granddaughter, Brittany, and his only grandson, Brett, who couldn't be with us today. Uh, I think he regretted that he didn't see more of them, but certainly being in Florida, it was a, it was a challenge for him to, to cover the distance, and, uh, and so he didn't get to see as much of them as he wanted. But last year, my sister came up with her, two, with her two grown kids, and we spent the day here at the museum where my dad showed off his collections and he showed off his office, and I know that, that pleased him tremendously. So we have some great memories of, um, of our childhood, but I would say that my father did have some flaws. Obviously, he, he dedicated uh, much of his life to the, to the pursuit of the science and, um, and his profession. Um, but that dedication and that drive and that energy was what really made him such a great scientist in the end. So, uh, and it was his life's passion. And this is not to say that he didn't make time for us, because obviously he did. Uh, we, we shared many great adventures uh, in Europe, out west, and primarily here just in Virginia on camping trips over the weekends and whatnot. Um, and in, in many ways, we wanted more of him, and that's partly what makes his passing so difficult, but um, he shared what he could. So as I mentioned, the trip to Bath County back in April didn't produce any spectacular bugs, but it gave us a chance to, to visit and uh, enjoy his company. And I know that that, uh, that thrilled his grandchildren, and it thrilled us too. Uh, he typically, and he surprised us that night when we got back from Bath County, he typically would, as uh, I think Steve might have mentioned earlier, or maybe it was, it, was, um, it was Bill, but he would not typically spend the night with us because he had to get back to Martinsville and do some work that evening. So he would oftentimes leave in the wee hours to get back. And, and so he surprised us when he said that he was going to stay. He spent the night with us and woke up the next morning thinking he was going to drive back, but he had car troubles. So he had to have his car worked on and we got to spend another day with him. So <laughs> two solid days. We were, we were thrilled. <clears throat> so Two weeks or so after that visit, he attended his 68th anniversary in Clifton Forge, 
and he also got to spend time that weekend with his brother Hank. So um, it seems as though almost that he had a, an opportunity here at the end to share more of his time with us, and we were very grateful for that, for whatever the reason might be. But the suddenness of his departure was certainly something that he was um, okay with. He didn't want to suffer a long, protracted decline, and he didn't want to be a burden in his old age. <laughs> so for this ending, I'm sure he was grateful. So we were with my father the evening that he was transported to Roanoke, and we were with him the morning before his surgery the next day. And we had some nice, lighthearted conversations, and he was very relaxed, and he went into the surgery uh, with a positive outlook, and he was eager to get past his recovery and so he could get back to work. And then he left us. And for that, we're sad, but by the way he did it, we should all be grateful because he didn't suffer. Rest in peace. We are proud to be your children and your grandchildren, and we'll miss you. Thank you. Thank you, Carl, and thank you, Mary. That was something very special for us all to hear. Um, we're going to kind of take a change of pace here a little bit, and uh, frankly said, I've never done this before, but we're going to try to give people the opportunity to share their memories of Richard. So I'm going to try to be, and we got the first volunteer right up front here. Now, before you get started, we are going to uh, try to keep things rolling. So I will not only pick a speaker, but I will pick the on-deck speaker. So if everyone could try to be dynamic, the on-deck speaker, please come over here to the side of my podium. And sir, if you would just go ahead and use the mic there at the middle, you get to be the lead-off speaker. So we... We have a mic right there for all of our speakers. So, and who's going to be next? Who's the on-deck speaker? We have thank you. Dr. Beard. Thank you. Come on over, Jim. All right. Let's go ahead and get this rolling. Okay. My name is Mike uh, Kostrob with a Hungarian accent, a good friend of Richard's. We started our friendship in 1963 when I, I came to VPI in 62 to teach entomology from Ohio State. And we found with Richard common interest in many ways. Richard joined me in 1963 to start the Insects of Virginia series. This one, you can see. And we co-edited 13 copies. And later, when I retired in 1992, he took over himself and this is the last issue of the Insects of Virginia series. <laughs> Richard was a very close friend of mine. We share a lot of common interest with him. This is how we had a number of trips to get there. I remember when on the top of the Mount Rogers, both of us slept in our sleeping bags. And we enjoyed many of such trips, including one especially on the <laughs> Buffalo Mountains. He showed me on Buffalo Mountain a special scale insects that covered the leaves, all the grasses. The grasses were white because the scale insects, the mealybugs, actually produce a lot of white uh, wax. And what happened, he gave me the chance to see it. So what happened, I sent the insect to Washington to make colleagues because it was a new thing. And they named that after me, imagine. So <laughs> they put the Kostarabi since that time. So I became more and more famous due to Richard. <laughs> now, what I want to say about Richard, he was a fantastic fellow. In Europe, we call such a person actually polyhistor. Some 
a person who knows everything about all the creatures, and it was true, it was true. He knew from the dry lands to the wet, wet lands, every the creatures, we always admire him because of that. At Redford, his students admire him, and also his colleagues here at the museum. I really had a lot to do with Richard since 1963. In 19, <laughs> just when he was 80 years old, we shared together, he was just three months younger than me. So we decided to share together our 80th birthday, and we went to Seritano's restaurant. I have a picture of him with me right there on the table. And we celebrated, both of us, I was born in July, he was born in September. So in the middle of that, in August, we had our celebration to get there. What I want to say about him, Richard was instrumental in initiating, in addition to not only the museum here, but also the society of the Virginia Naturalist Society and his it's periodical, the Banisteria that you have seen about. And I admired him in many ways, and I cannot say I really missed him very much. I think Richard will be missed by many of us, and I cannot say that I cannot forget him because he was fantastic. He used to come with his little dog, unbelievable. He always saved, saved some of the food for his dog whenever we ate to get there. And in addition to, I remember when he worked in his office, he, he, he stayed there overnight. And when he got real tired and fell apart, he had always a place to sleep in his, and in the morning came the cleanup lady and found him still in the couch sleeping. But this was Richard. <laughs> So in the many ways, I want to say that Richard, it is some, someone unusual and I admire him. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. Hi, I'm Jim Beard and I'm a geology curator here. Uh, Richard was one of the very first people I met when I came to this museum. And, uh, uh, he immediately recognized that the work I did scientifically was about as far as you could get from the work he did and immediately set on impressing me upon me how very important the study of recent invertebrates were uh, so that I would never lose sight of that fact. But I just want to share two stories about Richard, uh, one of which is sort of uh, an indication of his scientific work, another one is sort of an indication of how he expressed his love of natural history and shared it with everybody else. Uh, about one day, about 12 years ago or so, I had mentioned to Richard that I was going to go up to Virginia Tech to do some library work. And Richard said, oh, that's fine. Maybe he'll just go up with you. It's a nice day. Uh, so he took a state vehicle up there, and he dropped me off at Daring Hall. And I went up to the library to do what I was going to do. And he took off into the woods someplace around Blacksburg. He might even have gone to Burke's Garden and came back with a bag full of leaf litter. Well, about a couple of months later, he said, you know that little trip I took up there? I found a new species of millipede. So these opportunistic things, he was always thinking about where he could go next, taking every opportunity he could take to do what he loved to do best. The other story I want to mention, and a lot of you probably remember this, particularly people on the staff, who remembers the bug of the week? The bug of the week. Richard uh, was always finding great new stuff. and. His office was right next to mine downstairs in, in, in Douglas Avenue. And so I, I used to wander in there and say, so Richard, what have you found? He'd say, oh, I found this and I found that. And finally got so tired of me asking about this stuff. He said, I'm just going to have a bug of the week. And I said, great, a bug of the week. So I'd go in there and say, what was the bug of the week? He'd say, well, I found this or I found that. Or it's not a very good bug of the week or it's a great bug of the week. But eventually he started sharing the bug of the week with the entire museum. And I think it was a great way to let everybody know how interested he was in what he did, and to share what he did with everybody else. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Paul, and we need an on-deck speaker. 
Somebody else like to come up and are you on deck? Okay, we have an on deck speaker. Um, I'm Paul Merrick and I'm a, a millipede taxonomist from Tucson, Arizona. And um, I did uh, my PhD down in North Carolina on Appalachian millipedes and um, I was really close by so I'd always come up and, and visit Richard. And um, one of the first things that I was very impressed about was his sophisticated, gentlemanly um, appearance and uh, um, uh, very uh, friendly, outgoing um, warmth to him. And um, I also found that he was a very uh, quirky fellow as well. <laughs> and um, he would always talk about little millipedes that were difficult taxonomically with little gonopods that were difficult to look at and um, always refer to them as hateful little creatures. <laughs> and I thought that was so fantastic that I've uh, started saying it myself. Um, but I'd always love coming up to the museum and Richard would share with me these great stories of old millipede taxonomists, folks like Order Cook and Nell Causey and Leslie Hubricht and it was fascinating, um, and it really inspired in me an enthusiasm for uh, biodiversity, especially Appalachian biodiversity, um, that I've kept in my life, and I know that I've always um, am able to enjoy Appalachian biodiversity, um, partially as a result of um, Richard's encouragement. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jim Mulick. I live here in Martinsville. And I first met Richard in uh, 1995 at Snow's Restaurant. Now, those of you that laughed will get a kick out of this story. Uh, those that didn't, you need to come to Snow's sometime. Uh, Richard would eat many times a week there breakfast and lunch, and then he would go to Jerry's and eat pizza for dinner. But uh, I eat there four days a week for lunch. There's a group of us that meet there and enjoy the fun, and would often see Richard there, especially on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Tuesdays was a Pinto Beans Day, and Thursdays was a homemade soup day. And if you came into this museum as a new employee, Richard would take you to Snow's eventually. And we've had a lot of fun down there. Well, I have a game dinner every year at Snow's restaurant. And Doug Chapel hosts it for me and cooks. And we always invite Richard to come. He's part of our Snow's family. And he usually came unless he was on a trip someplace. Well, Richard had a favorite seat at Snow's, and if you've been to Snow's, his seat was the first stool on the corner right next to the ice machine. Behind him is a pillar, a wooden pillar, the only pillar in Snow's. Well, at one of the game dinners, somebody brought some liquid refreshment that's famously made in the county north of here, in Franklin County. And Richard didn't have much experience with that. And uh, this mason jar was passed around, and everybody had a little taste. And I think that year was Damson. It was delicious. And we were all talking and carrying on and telling stories and so on and so forth. And towards the end of the evening, Richard started to get it up to leave, and he got up, and he stumbled a little bit and staggered a little bit, turned around, and walked, boom, right into that pillar. Well, the chief of police was there, uh, Mike Rogers, who was a good friend of mine, and he was there enjoying that night, and he saw that happen, and he said, Jim, Jim, don't let Richard drive home. Well, David Jones was there that night also, another friend of Richard's. And David said, Jim, we got to get Richard home. we got to get him home. I said, all right, we'll take care of him. So we talked to Richard, and he said, oh, yeah, you guys can drive. But he said, I want to go back to the museum. 
And this is at the old Douglas facility. You know. So my son and I drive Richard back to the museum because Carla was there. He had to see Carla, take care of Carla. And I drove Richard's little old white wagon down there. And he got up to the door, and he's standing there at the door, and he's going like this, and he starts punching in the code. Well, I bet we stood there five minutes. Finally, he got inside, and I said, Richard, you going to be OK? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be fine. OK. Well, three days later, on Tuesday, I saw him at Snow's for lunch, Pinto Beans Day. And I said, Richard, you're OK? And he looked at me, and he said, what was that stuff? <laughs> he said, I still have a headache. Uh, the scientists here is, have said many great, wonderful things about him scientifically. Uh, he was a whole lot smarter than many of us. He was a great friend. He truly loved this museum and the staff here because he talked about you all the time. And uh, we miss him at Snow's. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn, you're up. My name is Lynn Pritchett, and I've had the privilege of coming, and I started as a volunteer with Virginia Master, with the Virginia Museum of Natural History, I'm nervous, um, over at the old building. And I used to report to work in the basement, and every time I would walk through the hall, his little long-haired dachshund, Carla, would greet me. Courtney Carter was there, I think that she started working for him when she was 14 years old as a volunteer. And what I would like to say about him is he had a way of impressing upon me that it was okay to believe things that I found unbelievable. He had a way of changing your mind in the gentlest of ways. I used to think it was an okay thing to kill poisonous or venomous, perhaps it's better to say snakes, but he was so upset with the fact whenever anybody did that. And he was an opportunistic person. When we were trying to gather our collections, if a snake had been run over in the road, he would honor its life by picking it up and bringing it to the museum to pickle in a jar later. Um, I did some volunteer collections with Dr. Nancy Moncrief. My family was horrified to find out that I would pick up dead squirrels and put them in Ziploc bags and put them in the freezer and bring them to the museum. And I had a uh, vole that my cat had killed and I was in a hurry and I stopped by Dr. Hoffman's office and asked him to do me the favor of getting that to her collection. Well, he put it under a microscope and found on its chin some sort of tick that absolutely amazed him. Later, I found a little creek minnow, a chub or something, I don't know what it was, but he later enthusiastically reported to me that he had found a leech attached to its side. This was a man who was so wonderful. I would drop by his office, poke my head in, see him hunched over his microscope, doing detailed drawings in pen and ink of the minutest detail in exquisite professional style. I will miss him. We, in the Virginia Master Naturalist chapter, we're always happy to have him come and help teach our classes. And when I think of him, I just simply find myself chuckling. And I just thrill to think for a man who spent so much of his life peering into a microscope, how wonderful he thought it to be when his eyes were all of a sudden wide open to see all that he was unable to see with the limitations we have in the physical body. Thank you, Lynn. Mel, you're next. Huh? Yeah, you are. Uh, I've got the mason jar. And the theme this week has definitely been Richard and fireflies. When I die, no one will replace me. Who said that? Dr. Richard Hoffman, Hoffman himself, as printed in a New York Times article back in 2002, almost 10 years ago. 
No one will replace his dedication, his passion, his knowledge, or his relentless work ethic. No one. Now, please don't take this the wrong way, but when Richard's family members sent their photos for a presentation, it kind of slapped me in the face. Because I wrongly thought that we, the people at this museum, were Richard's family. Well, not his real family, but the family you would pick if you had a choice because Richard Hoffman was the heart of this museum. He had more energy, patience, and talent than most all of us put together. So when I saw the large collection of loving family photos, I had to admit that Richard did have a real family, one he loved dearly. Thank you for sharing him with us for so long and so graciously. Simply put, Dr. Hoffman is irreplaceable. Richard will be dearly missed and by both of his families. Fa finally, the mason, mason jar in my hand, cue mason jar, it was my fondest intention to fill it with fireflies and present it to the youngest at heart or the youngest in the family. But a funny thing happened last night. I could not find one firefly. So we believe Richard took them all with him, at least for this season. And as Joel so beautifully said to me last night, you bet he did, and it surely lit his way. Thank you. Thanks, Mel. My name is Courtney Carter Plaster. And when I think of Dr. Hoffman, he was always Dr. Hoffman. Never Richard. I had the privilege of working with him, meeting him at the age of 14, volunteering formally at the age of 16. And as I look at his family, I just want to say thank you for letting him influence my life so greatly. I've continued loving the museums for the past 25 years. I've been a part of science museums and now a transportation museum in Roanoke, which I never thought would be possible. But I get to share part of Dr. Hoffman's influence in my life, which was lifelong learning. And as each of the speakers before me had shared about that, that truly was his unassuming way he shared the knowledge that he shared and the love and passion that he shared, it meant so very much to me. And as I look out, I see one of my good best friends. I grew up here in Martinsville, and in 1984, my dream had come true when the museum came to Martinsville. And I look out at Lynn Strickland, who's now married to John Anderson, and they're sitting right over there. John got to work with Dr. Hoffman as a biological lab technician for many years. As I sat next to John, got to work with him in the lab there with Dr. Hoffman too. I never knew that one day he would fall in love with one of my best friends. So I have to thank Dr. Hoffman for their union. And, um, and I wouldn't have met my husband who's sitting here without having been influenced by Dr. Hoffman. Um, if I hadn't been hooked at that early age with museum love and all of you that have spoken before, um, how much he loved working with you and being a part of something greater. And I just want to say to all of you, um, 
thank you for being part of my life, and I'm so glad that I got a chance to be part of Dr. Hoffman's life. He was truly a superhero to me, and he will continue to be so, and thank you. Thank you. And finally, we have uh, Carolyn, who has a presentation of her own and for the family as well. I had the pleasure of working with Richard the last 27 years, near and dear to my heart, as all of you. <clears throat> Lawrence, if you and Carl and Marion would come up. On behalf of the Virginia Museum of Natural History, we would like to present you with this scrapbook full of loving memories from our archives. We have so many, many pictures of Richard and in all uh, ways of life. Uh, we couldn't choose from them all. We also have uh, so many people could not be here today. They have sent um, emails and their love and just little quotes they have uh, knowing Richard and we so much wanted you to have these um, again near and dear to our hearts Richard will always walk the halls of this museum thank you thank you Carolyn All right, we're in the home stretch here. Uh, we have um, the Honorable Kim Adkins. Kim, where are you at? Why don't you come on up? Uh, Mayor Adkins was kind enough to read a proclamation to City Council, and we've asked her to come up and present that as well to the family. So, Kim, podium tour. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Family, friends, and trusted colleagues of Dr. Hoffman, thank you so much for this invitation to participate in this memorial service for Dr. Hoffman. I'm honored to be here today. As mentioned and noted in your program, I'm here to share with you a recent proclamation in memory of Dr. Hoffman from the city of Martinsville. Prior to my doing so, I would like to share just a few words about Dr. Hoffman from my perspective. I knew Dr. Hoffman from my civic and res professional responsibilities. On many occasions, I would seek out Dr. Hoffman when I attended special events at the museum, either here or at the former location. I could always spot Dr. Hoffman because he would be the one with the most people around him. In my view, and I'm sure from many due to the crowd that gathered around him at each one of these events, Dr. had a gift of storytelling and sharing with me and others details about facts we had never heard before. At the next event here, I'm going to miss seeking out Dr. Hoffman and hearing something unique about natural history or the specific exhibit that's on display and the museum that he was so much a part of. Now excerpts from the proclamation. Whereas on Sunday, June 10th, 2012, our Heavenly Father called to rest Dr. Richard L. Hoffman following a recent heart surgery at the age of 84 years old. Whereas Dr. Hoffman, a world-renowned scientist, was instrumental in founding the Virginia Museum of Natural History and his passing leaves the museum's staff with a deep feeling of sorrow for the loss of such an honored and respected person. Whereas Dr. Hoffman was a native Virginian and had devoted his life's work to natural history of Virginia and Southern Appalachians while also earning an international reputation. Whereas Dr. Hoffman has published more than 500 scholarly papers, books, and 50 articles. Whereas Dr. Hoffman's legacy to instill a better understanding of natural heritage will live on at the Virginia Museum of Natural History and around the world. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Kim Atkins, mayor, and all of members of city council hereby honor and remember the life of Dr. Richard L. Hoffman, give our sincere condolences to his family, 
friends and colleagues and proclaim the week of June 11, 2012 as Dr. Richard L. Hoffman Week in the city of Martinsville and do hereby call this observation to the attention of all of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Atkins. And for our final presentation, uh, may I call up the uh, Chairman, Board of Trustees, Virginia Museum of Natural History, Mr. Sammy Redd. What an honor it's been to be here today uh, and to share this time with Dr. Hoffman's family, uh, his colleagues, his students, and his academic, uh, academic fellow uh, scholars. Um, you know, as I sat here looking at this, um, I turned 40 this year. Um, there might be a few people in the audience that are 40 or above, perhaps. And um, like for maybe for many of us who turn 40, it's been a time of reflection for me uh, because it is what I hope is middle age. I hope I have another at least 40 years left on this earth. And so you begin to think about, well, what would a service like this be for me? When I pass on, what kind of memorial service and what kind of feelings and tributes would people have for me? And you begin to think, well, what is success? What is a life well lived? Well, I think any of us here today, based on the things that we've seen and we've heard, know that Dr. Hoffman had a life well lived. And uh, when I was, uh, uh, you know, casting around with all my friends, you know, with this, with this kind of midlife crisis that I had, um, I had a, a friend email something to me. It was a quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I think it's really appropriate to close today's uh, event, today's service. To laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty and to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is to have succeeded. And I think we can all say that Dr. Hoffman succeeded. So in recognition and appreciation of Dr. Hoffman's generous support of the Virginia Museum of Natural History and a lifetime of scientific contributions to the natural history of Virginia, it is my great honor to announce the naming of the Richard L. Hoffman Laboratory of Recent Invertebrates. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy. That laboratory now has a new name forever, and I'm, I'm proud to work here, and I'm, I'm proud to have a chance. Uh, many of you know I'm a bug guy by training, and I'll get a chance to go into the Hoffman lab uh, for the rest of my tenure here, and it's something I'll be very proud of. And speaking of pride, uh, I think we can all be proud of Richard. I can say that I think, you know, as a new Virginian, I've only been here two and a half years, that we should be proud of Richard proud of what he represents, proud of what this museum represents, and truly be proud of Martinsville. I think he is the one who catalyzes that message and takes it forward. For the rest of the afternoon, please feel free. We have some refreshments in the back. We hope everyone has a chance to interact and with each other, share your memories of Richard. Thank you for coming today. <laughs>